This patient has bilateral heel ulcers from not being able to move around. Uh, wound care is not really succeeding. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this because it's a short lesion, but I tend to use a lot of these sculpting balloons. Uh, these balloons, this is the angio sculpt. It has nitinol wires. It's a little hard to see here, but it has these nitinol wires going around the balloon. What that does is it creates cracks in the plaque in the stenosis as it's expanding. Just anecdotally and looking at our own internal data, we tend to have better success with lesions using this, um, especially if you're going to use a scaffold, whether it be any of the bare metal stents or anything, you want to have the vessel open as much as possible for stenting. Remember, stenting is not to fix a stenosis. Stenting is to keep open a vessel. So you're not using it to crack open the vessel, you're using it to keep it open. So putting in a stent is, is only useful when you've opened the vessel to its best caliber. No. Some people think that, oh, the stenosis is tight, you should stent this. No, fix the stenosis, then put the stent. Um, and that's the whole point. This patient now on the other side, this was a runoff. Uh, he also had bilateral problems, obviously. There's focal plaque in the proximal SFA. It's a little bit of ratty going down. Now, atherectomy wise, if you're going to use atherectomy, which you don't have to, um, I would use here either orbital, such as CSI. Uh, you can consider laser or you can consider a directional one if you want. There's other devices as well. Uh, for some reason, I said this is a good one for me to use laser. This is a creepy picture of a laser system and a guy. Um, now, laser works with many different types of plaque. It also has a benefit that it's supposed to be okay for also thrombotic plaque or thrombus. Um, there's less emboli because you're pulverizing uh, the clot with the eczema. And also, it's the only device that's indicated for instant restenosis. So you've sent it to the patient, they come back. It truly has really good data on treating with laser. There's two uh, laser brands that are out there. We use both. Spectronetics has the big generator and the catheters. And then RU1 is the other one that we have. There are two different laser uh, wavelengths. Um, and there's ups and downs of both. We're learning more about each. Um, but use it quite often for different cases. This is the laser device. Uh, this was a 2.0 uh, laser catheter. Now, for me, most often when I'm treating the s pop, I always keep a protection device. Uh, this is a spider filter protection device, same thing that's using the carotids for patients. And I have it distally and we're gonna run the laser and we're gonna put a filter. Now, you ask the reps for companies about uh, filters and they get a little nervous because they think that when you ask that, if they tell you you have to use a filter and you don't want to, you're not gonna use it. So they'll say, oh no, I have plenty of docs who don't use filters ever, no emboli, no big deal. Uh, trust your gut, trust your experience and trust your, your trainers, hopefully. And uh, here, this is after laser. This is the angio sculpt again. You can see the nitinol cage. It's trying to open up this lesion. It does eventually. I like to mag up on them to really see the areas that are tight and watch it pop open. You can go to high pressure. It's really hard to burst these balloons. Uh, this one ended up, uh, I think, DC being there. And this is the end result uh, of that case with laser and um, uh, ballooning. Now, when they tell you you don't need to filter, this is that same patient with laser. And you can see all this stuff that would have gone down for me in this case, down to the pop and into the tibials. And this is what I was telling you earlier, the, the worst thing you ever do is that you turn a clodicant into a CLI patient and you don't wanna do that. To me, this is critical. So it's a lesson learned that for me, anytime I'm gonna do it, I'm almost always gonna use a filter, just the way it is. Uh, you could develop your own practice patterns, uh, however you feel. Uh, we talked about IVUS in there, uh, a couple of reasons. So you can see inside the vessel to get a better idea of uh, your stenosis because the angiogram is only showing you that 2, 2D image. So if it looks open, it may be just pancaked. So I've been fooled many times. It shows you dissection flaps better because we tend to look at it and depending on the time of day and how many cases we have left, we'll say, oh, that flow looks good and I can convince any trainee that looks great. And you're going to say yes, but it helps us kind of get a better understanding of what we're dealing with. Some people like to use it to tell if they're truly luminal or not, which that's up to the operator if they really need it for that. Uh, where can it help you, for me at least? Um, this patient in the 60s, diabetic, hypertension, had a hallux wound that wasn't healing, eventual amputation of just that area of the tip. Um, no intervention was, was needed per other reports because they thought it looked pretty good, actually, which when you look at this, here's the aeroiliac coming down the SFA. There's some mild stenosis, what I would call it on the initial angiogram, maybe some mild stenosis of the AT, and the rest of it looked pretty good. 
However, it just doesn't make sense. I know you have to try, you have to look at non-invasive. That doesn't always make sense. You use your physical exam, and sometimes using IVIS helps you. Now, when you use IVIS across the SFA, what you find in a couple of those areas that I called mild are actually very moderate. You just can't appreciate. You can see a majority of the vessel has this plaque. This is the color flow on the uh, IVIS catheter. The IVIS catheter that <clears throat> we have, the Phillips one, has three catheters, 035, 018, and 014. The 018 and 014 give you color. The 035 does not. So I typically use 018, rarely 014. If I'm going to tip those, you can use that. It doesn't matter. Um, but it really gives you more information now. Does it force your hand to treat something? Um, maybe, but this patient wasn't healing. So if I can do something comfortably and with success, then I'm going to try it. I talked to the patient about whether or not it's going to work, but we're, we want to do everything we can to optimize. It also gives you an accurate measurement of the vessel lumen uh, diameter. Uh, there you can see wall to wall here, and this is the lumen, so you get a percentage. Now, one reason I think IVIS has some benefit is all of us have used bigger and bigger balloons all the way to tibials now, much bigger than we ever used to use. And I think that's partly because we feel better having these numbers coming from IVIS. So this patient, now that I know it's much more severe, this is a seven millimeter uh, sculpt balloon all the way in the distal pop or mid pop. And then this is ballooning in the AT. The distal, everything looked much better. However, if you pay attention here, that AT I didn't really like and I wanted to see better. You can, I don't know if you guys can see this little shelf here, this little contrast mismatch. And what you see on IVIS is a dissection flap right in the middle. It's not flow limiting, but if I just mess with this vessel, I need to do whatever I can to optimize this because I created that. I was trying to improve this and I created that. I don't want that to shut down. So you have a dissection flap there. What do you put there? A lot of us commonly put coronary drug eluting stents because that's been the best in this area. Uh, in this case, I use the TAC, which are little focal dissection repair uh, stents. They're not a full length stent. You can put uh, as many as you want, one to four to six. Uh, so I put that here. And also in the SFA, this is the, you didn't really see this earlier, I didn't show it to you, but this is a dissection flap in the SFA as well. And I don't want to leave that. So usually in the past, I would put a bare metal stent, or if you really want to, a covered stent, which you don't really have to use. Um, but I would have to span that cover stent at the minimum four centimeters. But here, I'm able to put these tacks, and you can put them as close as you want just to cover that flap. When you use a stent to cover a dissection flap, that's not as indicating the uh, use. It's to use it to uh, keep a vessel open that's not uh, staying open. So here, this is after putting those tacks, it really came in handy. Why do I use tack? It's focal dissection repair. So for me, that was a good indication here. It's less material. We always try to say less is better. It's easy to deliver, so for me, this has been introduced into my practice a little bit more. This is the completion angio. Sometimes you get into really difficult cases. This is a patient that I learned early on that I should have had some better tools, maybe some better understanding. Um, and you know, you kind of bite yourself. A uh, 68-year-old patient, uh, renal transplant that's failing, also has life-limiting claudication. So CO2 angiogram, this is the transplant renal artery. You can see there's heavy disease above and below the vessel. Um, so and then running down here, you can see that heavy calcium on these native images with CO2 there. Just diffuse, heavy, chunky calcium. So uh, this is the runoff on the actual angio, if you want to see it. Um, uh, the SFA is occluded. Uh, the proximal popliteal reconstitutes, and there's decent runoff. Now, the first step, because you've got the family renal transplant and claudication is, uh, I put a reverse curve catheter into the renal artery and stent it above and below it. That was to improve the renal transplant to see does that fix this claudication too? It did not, it fixes renal transplant, but the claudication persisted and progressed. So I brought him back in a few months. Now in that type of calcium I showed you with diffuse occlusion, uh, am I gonna stay luminal the whole way? I'm pretty positive, no. I'm gonna be partly subminimal, maybe mostly subminimal. And dealing with those rock hard calcifications is a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, so for him, and because of the stents I put in and all the calcifications, I went anagrade. I always say use ultrasound. Sometimes I don't do it, but that's because I have a heavy, heavy landmark here with the calcium. Sometimes it's almost easier to stick it when you have rocks in that, uh, that common from artery. You can see everything a little bit better. So I do say ultrasound 100%, but that's just because I, I want you to do what I say, uh, not the opposite. But once you get in there, you can see I've shown you this before. This is that subminimal pattern. You can see the loop of the wire. It's just going to go in this wavy pattern through these calciums in the subminimal space. Eventually pop back in with an 018 click cross. Uh, and uh, 018 wire. I think it was a command 018 at that time. And then start ballooning. Now, this is the learning lesson about uh, learning to be more aggressive. Um, 
this is a balloon. You can see it's on the periphery of this heavy, heavy calcified disease, making this wavy pattern as it goes down. And in this case, I was just so happy. It was one of my younger cases. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm so happy. I got lumen to lumen. That's all I care about. Put a silver PTA experimental stent. You can see I did not do a good job. This stent did not open up all the way. I didn't treat that, treat that vessel ahead of time better. This is that Hunter's Canal. You can see how it's just very narrow. Even after ballooning on different views, you can see this. Try to balloon it some more. At that point, you've already kind of started your process. And uh, this is how it ended. I thought maybe he'll do all right, but sure enough, came back with pain, stenosis on ultrasound, actually occluded. Tried to go across the stents uh, to the distal area. You can see where it reconstitutes. Couldn't get across, had to come from below. It's a lot of work to do even when you have stents there, but doing a safari just to get through the stents. Um, and then what do you do? You've already stented it. You're kind of stuck there. You could try to laser through it. Here I tried a, a, a balloon expandable bare metal stent just to crack it open stronger and then put another layer of Viabon and other stuff. At the end of the day, um, got some better flow. He did all right actually, but the learning curve there was uh, you got to treat that vessel a lot better before you put in the metal. It's, it's a little exciting to get across and you think that's the hardest part. It's not. It's what's your final intervention and what is it going to look like? Um, in that same patient, had I had that same situation now, what would I do? I may consider shockwave. Use that quite a bit more now. Uh, shockwave, for those of you that haven't seen it yet, it's basically thinking about uh, kidney stone shocking, the same principle using uh, sonic, sonic waves to crack medial wall calcifications. That's the goal of it. Um, it's expensive, but it's getting a lot of use and it's starting to get codes to be able to use. So hopefully there's going to be some reimbursement. There's a learning curve to it. The nice thing about it, it's used very low atmosphere balloon pressure. It's four atmospheres while you're creating those cracks. And I think for areas of tight um, uh, calcified stenosis, common femoral artery, SFA, even uh, now they have below the knee, uh, it's not meant for the entire vessel, but especially those really hard areas, it does really well. So you can see this patient has really chunky calcium in that distal SFA uh, and proximal pop has been stented before above and below. You can see this is the balloon at four atmospheres. It's trying to create um, a little bit of a lumen. And even though you see those, these, those little uh, chunky areas, the lumen of itself is actually better. So I've uh, been gaining a lot of use of it. I think there's some benefits in certain areas and um, it's something that we're gonna learn about. Now, some general thoughts once you're across the SFA. Uh, here we talked about subinimal. Um, you can see the, this is what happens to that wire as it goes subinimal. You can see that pattern coming across. And this one, I think, it's okay, you might consider orbital atherectomy. Now, one thing people ask is, well, what about atherectomy in subminimal space? Um, is that safe to do? You can see the runoff after balloon angioplasty. Um, the question about atherectomy in subminimal space, it's okay um, if you know that you're lumen to lumen and it's a short segment of subminimal space, you, it might benefit you because it helps you gain that lumen at that entry re-entry zone. That's where you tend to have a lot of recurrent stenosis, recurrent disease. So doing a little bit of vessel prep in those areas may, may, may make your outcome a little bit better. Uh, you have to be careful though, because you can cause perforations and cause pain. So you want to look for those things in that patient. If they're having pain, stop. Uh, but doing a little CSI, sometimes a hawk in those re-entry uh, entry zones of that CTO may be helpful. This patient after ballooning uh, didn't really like this area, just kind of a gut feeling. So use the angioscope. This is a seven millimeter and you can see there's a waste there and finally get it to expand. This is something you have to know about angiosculpts. Uh, they're a little finicky as you're putting in the sheet, depending on the sheet you're using. And they can get these little kinks or little areas of the balloon that cause a little bit of waste. This wasn't a waste. This is actually just in the balloon itself. And you know that by repositioning the balloon, which I do for sculpts, you'll see that same waste at a different location. So uh, just be wary of that if you're using the uh, scoring balloon. It's, it's because you have a long night and cage just wrapped and you're putting in the sheath, it sometimes can cause a little uh, narrowing of the balloon itself. Um, this is after uh, the completion with the angioscope just felt better about it. Um, you might consider, am I done here? Um, the patient's got a PT pulse back. Um, you can leave it here, you can DCB for me. In that case with heavy, heavy calcium, I'm, still minimal, I'm going to stent it, um, just personal preference. Um, patient got better, ABI was better, now the other side was worse, so we treated them. Uh, this patient, you can see there's kind of diffuse areas of calcium. Uh, there's a SFA occlusion with distal reconstitution, um, just past it. Now tried from above, couldn't cross, come from below as we talked about, 018 system. 
and um, it couldn't get across. So here's an outback reentry device and trying to go into a snare with a microcatheter from below. You can see that this is the micro snare four millimeter. This is the needle going into it, pull the wire all the way down. And then here, like I talked about, sometimes this is a hawk directional atherectomy. Um, I'll do that across that subdermal space because it's calcified. I feel like I need something to give me better uh, luminal expansion there. So in that case, I'll atherectomize. Uh, this is what it looked like. There's a flap there at that area that we did the atherectomy, but the caliber is good. Therefore, uh, put a scaffold step in there. So we talked about be careful with subdermal atherectomy. Uh, we're getting near the end here. Uh, patient in the early 70s, uh, the same comorbidities all our patients have, bilateral rest pain, had been treated elsewhere on the left side and came in with right pain for about one to two months. You can see the initial angiogram here. Uh, there's some disease in the external leg, which we fixed. Coming down, you can see kind of diffuse SFA disease, uh, coming down into another segment reconstituted and coming to the popliteal artery. Now, one thing uh, that I think is important that you guys should remember is the wire test. This is just the uh, 035 catheter and, a, and an Amplatz wire. And you can see the wires coming down and it's kind of going right through this thing. And you get lucky every now and then. So the wire is going and it seems to be going luminal. My catheter is falling right through it. That's awesome because you get super excited. Um, so the thing about it, am I just that good? Is the equipment just the best? Or what you have to think about is that lesion is not chronic. That's not a chronic lesion for your wire to stay luminal and go right through it. So in this case, if my wire does that quite often nowadays, what I'm thinking about is I have clot in there. So for me, I switch over to an eight French sheath and then I put a cat eight as a penumbra catheter and I see if I can find what's going on. If I could pull out some, some clot rather than actually uh, an occlusion. Uh, this is kind of when you see the device going with the lightning now, it takes out less blood, um, but it helps you feel a little more confident about aspirating because you're not just sucking up blood at a high rate. Uh, this is a little separator to kind of help pull some clot in there. This is one of the little pieces that came out. There was another picture of more clot, but you can see that's, a, that's some plaque there that had jammed in there. This is the result after uh, aspiration and after angioplasty. So uh, on the table, did not have to cross this entire area. It was just a focal area that had disease. Uh, you can choose to balloon it, atherectomize after it. Often we'll use laser because if there's thrombus in there, I feel better about pulverizing it with labor, with the eczema laser, uh, just personal preference here. And the runoff was preserved, looks good. Um, there's a laser cat technique that we're writing up, we're working on a couple of us around the country. And the reason is because whether you have an acute limb or a non-acute limb, when you see that long CTO, a lot of times you have clot in that long CTO. It's not all like a rock with the entire thing. So if your wire goes right through, like I showed you, what you might have in that CTO is actually just clot between that area. So if my wire passes through, a lot of times now I'm considering aspiration right in between. Um, so the wire goes through, do aspiration. And then if there's some disease left behind, because usually you'll find that the disease is a short segment, I'll then consider laser atherectomy and then ballooning, stenting, whatever you need to do. The key being that instead of a 25 centimeter CTO that I stented or whatever I did, I ended up maybe having a five to 10 centimeter segment, which is much better. We know from data on outcomes when you have a short lesion versus long lesion. So it's something we're looking at. It's less, um, less costly when you think about it. if you thought it was thrombus and you had to perform thrombolysis overnight. Um, this is some within a stent that did the same thing with aspiration thrombectomy. You can see what came out, but also this came out. I don't think TPA would have cleared this out. Also, if you didn't do something about this, if you didn't know it was thrombus, what you're going to end up doing is just ballooning it. You're just macerating and pushing this uh, clot or mixed age clot against the walls. It could embolize. So we're learning more about this. And some of us are adapting this into our. Uh, in